I'm Travis Morrison, and I'm going to talk about an algorithm for computing the endomorphism ring of a supersingular elliptic curve. This is joint work with Kirsten Eisentrager, Sean Hallgren, Chris Leonardi, and Jennifer Park. So let's let E be an elliptic curve over FQ, it's a finite field with cardinality Q. Then the endomorphism ring, ND, is either rank two or rank four as a Z module. If ND is rank two, E is called ordinary. And if ND is rank four, E is super singular. When E is ordinary, it's endomorphism algebra, ND tensor Q is an imaginary quadratic field. On the other hand, if E is super singular, then it's endomorphism algebra is a quaternion algebra ramified exactly at the prime P, which is the characteristic, and infinity. And moreover, the endomorphism ring of E is a maximal order in its endomorphism algebra. So today I want to talk about computing that maximal order. But first let's look at the ordinary case. When E over FQ is ordinary, if we let pi denote the Frobenius endomorphism, then Z adjoined pi is a non-trivial quadratic suborder of the endomorphism ring. And the, the full endomorphism ring is some uh, suborder of the ring of integers of its endomorphism algebra. And so the whole game is computing this index of z adjoined pi in ND. In 1996, Cole gave a q to the one third plus epsilon time algorithm for computing this endomorphism ring. And then in 2009, Usan and Sutherland gave a sub exponential algorithm. When E is super singular, then in general, so for a general super singular elliptic curve, there's no obvious quadratic imaginary orders which embed into ND. So in other words, it's hard to find even one quadratic suborder of the full endomorphism ring. Moreover, we know that the endomorphism ring is rank four, so finding one suborder isn't going to be enough. So altogether, this means that computing the endomorphism ring of E is going to be uh, much different in the super singular case and is going to require uh, a different a different approach. So this problem is certainly interesting in its own right, but it's also important because it's connected to the security of several isogeny-based crypto systems, which are post-quantum. So these are crypto systems that are believed to be secure even against an adversary with a quantum computer. So for example, uh, if one has an efficient algorithm for computing the endomorphism ring of a super singular curve, you could use it, for example, to break uh, several crypto systems like the hash function of Charles Warren and Lauder or the key exchange SIDH of uh, DeFeo, Zhao, and Plu. And it could also be used to break practical instantiations of Seaside. So I want to talk about an algorithm with the Eisentrager, Hogger, and Leonardi, and Park for computing the endomorphism ring of a super singular elliptic curve, which assuming several heuristics, uh, including but not limited to the generalized Riemann hypothesis, that the runtime of this algorithm is p to the one half times log p squared. And we're going to do it in part at least with isogeny graphs. So this is a common theme for computing uh, endomorphism rings of, of any elliptic curve or a finite field. So we're going to use the super singular isogeny graph. So let's let P and L be distinct primes. P is the characteristic of the field our curve is defined over, and L you should think of as small, some small constant prime like two or three. And the vertices of this graph are the isomorphism classes of supersingular elliptic curves, say represented by their J invariants. And then the edges in this graph uh, come from L isogenies. So we'll have one, L, uh, one edge between E and E prime for every uh, degree L isogeny between these two curves. So here's the uh, three isogeny graph in characteristic 157. So this graph G of PL is always finite. And this is because there are about P many super singular J invariants in FP bar. They're actually all in FP squared. It's an L plus one regular graph, meaning the out degree of every vertex is L plus one. And this is because there's one outgoing edge for each of the L plus one mini cyclic subgroups of our L torsion. It's a connected graph too. Uh, and moreover, the paths between any pair of vertices are short relative to the size of the graph. 
So you should think that this is an exponentially large graph with very short paths. And in fact, it's a Ramanujan graph, which means that random walks um, mix, in, in a sense, as, as fast as possible. Uh, what, what we'll need is the fact that a random walk will land in a set with probability proportional to the size of that set divided by the size of the graph. So how are we going to use this to compute anamorphism rings? Well, with the observation going back to Cole's thesis that a cycle in this graph will give us an anamorphism. If we, for example, look at this blue cycle based here at 10, if we compose the isogenies along the cycle, um, we'll get an anamorphism of the curve at this vertex 10. And if we get two cycles which don't overlap, except at their base point, then they're going to generate a suborder of the full endomorphism ring. So if alpha comes from the blue cycle and beta comes from the red cycle, then one alpha, beta, alpha times beta is rank four. So as I mentioned in Cole's thesis, he gives an algorithm for computing the suborder by finding two cycles in the L isogeny graph. He does this by computing a spanning tree in the isogeny graph. So now an algorithm of Delfs and Galbraith uh, can improve this. They give a p to the one half time algorithm for computing endomorphisms of super singular elliptic curves. Theirs is a little different. They're not computing cycles in the L isogeny graph, but in some larger isogeny graph, super singular elliptic curves. So again, our, our algorithm uh, is going to have time p to the one half times log p squared. And here's a uh, overall outline of what we're going to do. So we're going to start off by computing two cycles in the isogeny graph to get a suborder of the endomorphism ring, much like Coel does. Uh, and this step we're going to do in, in this time here, p to the one half times log p squared, again, assuming, say, GRH. So now we have a suborder, and we want to find the correct maximal order uh, containing our suborder, which is the endomorphism ring. And the primes dividing the reduced discriminant, at least the primes given from P, are the primes where our order is not maximal. And so in part of our work, we give an algorithm for enumerating the maximal orders containing a ZQ order. So we, for example, solve the enumeration problem locally in step two. And then in step three, we're going to use our local information to solve the global enumeration problem. So by taking different choices of local Q maximal orders for the various primes Q dividing a reduced discriminant of our order. We can put those together to get maximal Z orders and then check if they're isomorphic to MD. So I'll say a little bit about how that's done towards the end. So uh, previous work for computing the anamorphism ring, um, Galbraith, Petit, Shani, and T give a uh, algorithm for um, computing the endomorphism ring, or at least sketch it. Um, and they suggest that you can compute cycles in the two isogeny graph, say, until you have enough cycles to generate the full endomorphism ring. And heuristically, one is going to need about log p many such cycles. And in our work, we're instead going to compute a good quality suborder and then enumerate maximal orders containing it until finding the endomorphism ring. So, uh, Heuristically, this enumeration step is going to take less time than it takes to compute one extra cycle. And also, heuristically, we expect to only need a constant number of cycles to find a, um, one of these nice enough suborders. So altogether, we get an algorithm uh, which takes uh, a constant number of calls to our cycle finding algorithm. And the cycle finding algorithm takes about square root p time. This means overall we save a humble factor of log p in the complexity. So let me say a little bit about how we compute this suborder. The observation we're going to use, which goes back to uh, the work of Charles Gorn and Lauder, they, they, they call this idea the, the generic attack on their hash function, um, or some variant of this. Uh, is we're going to use the fact that if E1 is adjacent to E2, then the curve E1 to the P is adjacent to E2 to the P 
where e to the p is the curve you get by raising the coefficients of e to the p power. So this is the image of e under the Frobenius map. And so what we're going to do then is try to find a path from our initial curve e0 to e0 to the p. Uh, and we're going to do this by looking for curves, say, that are defined over fp, or say, that are adjacent to e to the p. So let me sketch how that works. We start at e0, and we walk in the graph until we happen to find some curve defined over fp. This means that e2 has to be also adjacent to e1 to the p, and e1 to the p must be adjacent to e0 to the p. And so we now have a path from e0 to e0 to the p. And so we'll repeat this step again and say maybe this time we find a curve which is adjacent to a Scalois conjugate curve. And so now we have a second path from e0 to e0 to the p, which means we have a cycle. So this means we need to find uh, four of these um, special curves in the isogeny graph. Now, assuming GRH, there's about square root p many curves defined over fp and about square root many curves adjacent to their uh, conjugate curve like this. So this means that a random walk is going to find one of these with probability about square root p. So if we take about square root p many of these, we'll expect to find one, and we need to do this a constant number of times. So having computed a suborder, we want this suborder to be um, nice enough, as I mentioned earlier. So remember, the anamorphism ring is a maximal order. And we show that the enumeration step will be uh, efficient as long as we compute a Bass order. So uh, the next thing we argue, again, heuristically, is that we only need a constant number of calls to our cycle finding algorithm to compute one of these Bass orders. So not only can we generate an order with a constant number of cycles, but we can generate a Bass order with a constant number of cycles. What about the enumeration step? So the, the main um, challenge is enumerating in the split case. So here um, we have some order in the matrix algebra, the two by two matrix algebra over the Q-adic rational numbers. Um, and we want to enumerate all the maximal orders containing lambda. And one can show that the set of maximal orders containing lambda forms a subtree of the bruja titz tree. So this is a tree whose vertices are maximal orders in this quaternion algebra. So the idea here is we can use an algorithm of John Voigt to compute one maximal order containing lambda. And that gets us up into the subtree. And now we just need to explore the subtree of maximal orders containing lambda to find all of those orders. So once we do this for each prime dividing the reduced discriminant, we now have a, all the collections of Q maximal orders containing lambda. And now we can put these together with a sort of local global principle for quaternion orders. And so we'll enumerate these maximal orders containing lambda one by one. Um, and at each step, checking whether the curve is isomorphic to the anamorphism ring of E. And one can do this with an algorithm uh, essentially due to Galbraith, Petit, and Silva in 2016. Um, they show that if you have a maximal order in this quaternion algebra ramified at P and infinity, you can efficiently compute a curve whose endomorphism ring is isomorphic to that maximal order. So that means we can actually check which of these are correct. So as I said, we, meant, we, we introduced a new heuristic on uh, the probability of computing a Bass order. So we ran some uh, experiments to see how often this occurs. So here's what the experiment was. Uh, for each of these primes in this table, we computed 100 pairs of cycles at random J invariants that are in FP squared but not in FP. The reason for restricting to those is those are the ones where Frobenius isn't a non-trivial, where Frobenius is just multiplication by P, so we don't know a non-trivial quadratic suborder. So we recorded how often that pair of cycles gave us an order. We recorded how often that order was vast. And we also computed this number, n of lambda, which is an upper bound on the number of maximal orders containing lambda. So it's defined like this. If the reduced discriminant 
uh, factors this way, where the QIs are not equal to P, and N of lambda is this product of EI plus one. So one can show that um, this is an upper bound on the number of maximal orders consuming lambda, and we reported the average value of this here. So we can see that uh, this seems to be, on average, a small number. Here I have the histograms for um, these experiments for the n of lambda. And so we can see that um, it seems like, in, in each case, the, the, this n of lambda number is, is much smaller than it, it possibly could be. I mean, sometimes it's very big here, but that seems pretty rare. So it seems like the enumeration step uh, should, be, should be actually pretty, pretty efficient. We can prove that it's sub-exponential when the reduced discriminant is square-free, but uh, having a square-free reduced discriminant occurred actually very rarely in our data. That doesn't mean the enumeration step still won't be efficient. One can do a little bit better than this um, local and then global enumeration. One can instead enumerate the local orders containing lambda, which are maximal, and then check which one uh, is the correct um, is the correct localization of the endomorphism ring. And this check will be efficient as long as the prime Q we're localizing at is small. Uh, so this, this will make this N of lambda number in this, in this slide actually much smaller if you handle the small prime powers dividing the discriminant with this, um, with this local uh, checking algorithm. So we think that um, this, this part uh, could actually be made much faster. And looking at our data for these reduced discriminants, the, the primes dividing this discriminant were often um, significantly smaller than P. And I think in future work, it would be interesting to look at, uh, say, what the distribution of the divisors of these reduced discriminants look like. Thanks for watching. <laughs>